Um, hello, and uh, welcome to this screen capture. Uh, my name is Kira Wisniewski. I am the Executive Director of Art and Feminism, and I am here today with, you can introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Alex. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Midwest Regional Ambassador. Um, I'm Allison, also she, her pronouns. I'm the Northeast Regional Ambassador. So today, what we're going to try to do is to show you not everything about Zoom, because there are actually a lot of great resources about that, but really trying to focus on some features of Zoom that art and feminism organizers might consider using when organizing a virtual event. Um, so that being said, just dive right into it. Uh, one of the first pro tips though, in general is for you yourself and to remind your, all of your participants to download the most recent version of zoom in terms of updates. So they do updates pretty frequently. And if you aren't keeping up on those updates, it can make things a little wonky for, um, your participants and yourself. So that's kind of the tip number one. But one of the first things we'll do is just renaming. So you'll see like right now, my username is art feminism, which is cause I'm logged in as the art feminism account. So I go ahead and click this dot, dot, dot in the upper right and then rename. And then I can type in my name and I can put in my pronouns and, uh, there you have it. Um, Another thing is, is we encourage video to be on when possible for all participants, but of course that might not be possible for a variety of reasons. But if you need to go off for whatever reason, that's this button right here. So I have clicked stop video and now it's the Art and Feminism logo up there, one of our many logos. Um, another thing that I think is pretty beneficial for myself um, I get distracted by looking at myself. And so, but I don't necessarily like it's, I feel comfortable with Allison and Alex seeing me in the meeting. So I don't necessarily want to turn off the video, but you can hide self view. This changed my life, uh, this summer. So again, go up to the upper right corner, click the dot, 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 and then hide self view. And then also like in a meeting like this, then it's like real nice because then it's just, I just see it, Allison and Alex on the screen. Yes. Oh, so there are three main types of Zoom views, and Kira's going to toggle through these while I talk about them briefly. The first one is gallery view, where you can see me, Kira, and Allison, and everyone in the Zoom. The second is speaker view, and this changes the view to whoever is speaking and follows their camera. And then pin view will lock. Um, the view of whoever's camera that you choose. And then I'm going to quickly screen share here so Kira can show you what that looks like. Ooh, oh, I think I actually forgot a point right here, which is a good another good lesson to okay. share right here is in order for screen sharing, that can either be a setting that you do on the back end um, before the meeting starts, because all the settings on the back end of Zoom, you can't change them during the meeting for them to catch. Unfortunately, um, people, if you were, if there was a big thing you needed to do, you'd have to ask everybody to leave and come back if you're changing something on the back end. But kind of a workaround for the screen sharing part here is I can go ahead and I can make both Alex and Allison co-host. Oops, wrong button there. <laughs> um, and then they will have the ability to not only like do all the things that I can do as a host, but also um, can share a screen now. So there you go. So then you see here this little like double line next to the pictures between the share screen. You can toggle that. So if you wanted to see the participants more and the, the share screen small, you can do that. You can make it like, you, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and this is just for you. So this is just on your view. Um, Allison and Alex don't see me doing this right now. So yeah, wanted to share about that feature. Another big Zoom tip is muting. Sometimes people might leave their mics on by accident and that can lead to a lot of background noise and disruption in the meeting. And people might 
purposely leave the mics on to cause intentional disruption. That's something we'll talk about a little later when we talk about Zoom bombing. Um, in that case, it's super easy to mute participants if it's clear their mics are on, but they obviously aren't contributing to the meeting. So you can do that individually by, as the host, by just like, as you're seeing right now, I can mute Allison, um, but then I can't unmute her. So I would have to, I could click ask to unmute and then she'll get something that pops up on her screen that says that. And then also to mute myself is this microphone in the bottom left. And then if I wanted to mute everyone, I have that ability as well. It doesn't mute, it doesn't mute myself, but it would mute everybody else. Um, so that that's muting. And now Allison's gonna tell us about chatting. Oh, but you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That'll happen. Um, I've done it more than once. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is do a little myth busting. Uh, it is a myth, happily, that meeting hosts can see the private messages sent from one participant to the other if they're not sent to the host. So um, <clears throat> like, when the text file, we're going to talk about files in a little bit, the, the ones that come to your computer after the, the meeting is over. In those text files, only the full chat will be available and any messages that were private sent to or from the host who saved the chat. So private messages, for instance, between Alex and Kira, I would not be able to download them. Um, so let's see in terms of kind of strategy here um hosts can allow or even encourage private messages to the host if um, participants in your event are having issues or want to ask for more private questions although it might be good to encourage public um, messages of questions and clarifications just to um, introduce or reiterate things to the whole group <clears throat> excuse me and chat can be a great way for people who are not comfortable speaking aloud in the meeting to participate um, and they can be made more comfortable if the host encourages and normalizes chat usage. Um, and it's a great place for people to, you know, engage without speaking because it can be a lot to speak in a Zoom, especially with people that you don't know. Um, <clears throat> I mean, and there are so many ways for the chat to be used in an event. Uh, the host can pose, oh, <laughs> the host can pose questions and prompts and uh, participants can do the same, of course. And one thing that we'd like you to consider is to type important points from the conversation or presentation into the chat um, to reiterate things and to make the environment more comfortable for those who learn or engage differently. The other thing I just want to highlight about the chat too, that if you're, for instance, sharing um, a reference point or a slide deck, um, share that frequently because if people join at different parts, they don't see the chat that happens before they've joined. So if you have people kind of rolling in and you're sharing, for instance, a slide deck you're going through, or maybe you put together a really great lib guide, um, be sure to share that frequently in the chat throughout your event to just to make sure that everybody gets it. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about recording. Um, to record or not to record, that is the question. Um, sometimes it's cool and fun to have events be a little more ephemeral <clears throat> where you don't record them. And sometimes, of course, up to you, you might want to save the event for posterity. Um, it's important to let your guests know either way, um, whether the live, um, the Zoom meeting they're in is going to be recorded just because that um, gives different feels to people. Um, so you have options. If you record a meeting, you can save them to your computer or to the cloud. And um, you can decide where, so if you, if you don't want to save to the cloud, you want to save to your computer. Um, I found personally that the default location set by Zoom is confusing. Um, for instance, it's saved in my like documents uh, area and I've never looked there. So um, it's a great idea to change the default um, place where this saves, and um, that is easy to do. Um, let's see. Immediately after the recorded event ends, a folder of files representing your just finished meeting will appear in the place that you previously identified. And um, there will be typically four items, which can be a little confusing. Um, so let's see. 
What is in those folders? What is in that file? Four, four, four files. Sorry. <laughs> what is in that folder? Four files. The MP4 file is an audio and video file of your recorded meeting, which is what you'd want to use if you're going to upload this somewhere else like YouTube. The M4A file is audio only, which I'm not quite sure what you would use that for personally. Um, the M3U file is a playlist file, which Zoom says it's for Windows only, but seems to open and play on Mac, just FYI. And then the last um, file is the text file, TXT which is the chat that occurred in the meeting, which remember includes the private messages sent to and from the host, but not private messages sent between other participants. And um, since it's a text file, it's really easily uh, editable. So you can take out those private messages if you plan to post this chat anywhere else. I'm gonna talk a little bit about breakout rooms and what you need to know about them. Hosts can set the number of rooms and the duration of time spent in the breakout rooms, and the participants can head back to the main room at any time, but they'll also receive a one minute warning before the room is up. At that point, they'll automatically be sent back to the main meeting. And it's helpful to explain this and lay this out for participants as the process can be a little bit confusing. And hosts can pop into the different rooms to check in and see how they're going and also troubleshoot. Uh, breakout rooms might be a really helpful addition to your edit-a-thon if you're considering using Zoom because it offers smaller groups um, to meet a little bit more privately and intimately during the edit-a-thon. I would also say a pro tip about um, breakout rooms is that even though they can be really great, people don't love them, at least not initially. So I think kind of a pro tip around that would be try to do two other engagement activities first before going into breakouts, because that kind of warms everyone up a little bit and makes them a little bit more willing to participate in a breakout room. And the other pro tip I would say about breakout rooms is really try to set everybody up for success by giving them a prompt. Like, don't just be like, all right, now go meet each other. Like, ask them something really specific. Like, um, what was the first wiki article you edited? Or what'd you have for breakfast? You know, you can do any kind of little prompts just to get people talking. And then it's up to them on whether they stay on that or not. But giving them that it kind of helps, like, subside the, the awkwardness of like, so we're in a breakout room now, <laughs> which... I feel like we've all we've all been there. Yes, an icebreaker like that actually really truly broke the ice in a breakout room at the recently. So that is such a great tip. Um, there are a couple of options and possibilities for using breakout rooms. Uh, these are just a couple of ideas. And if you those watching have other ideas, please send them to us so that we can share these great ideas. Um, and this is once you've established um, once you're feeling confident that your participants are going to like the breakout room and you've thought of a good icebreaker. Um, for instance, in an edit-a-thon, you can put people together in rooms based on skill level or interest or to discuss issues and co concepts brought up during the training. Um, and then during a panel or a more discussion-based event, you can place people into more random rooms to discuss issues brought up during the event after they tell you what their last ice cream eaten was. And so for this meeting, I'm showing you the, the, you can't see it right now, but I'm showing the breakout prompt. I didn't click in the setup part. You can actually like set up before the meeting launches again, what kind of rooms you would want and you could even name them. We didn't do that for this demo, but it would, it would pop up here if it did, but you can see the various options here. Um, so something I want to share next is about, um, we all generally know about screen sharing, but something that's really specific that we um, doesn't seem to be super well known is how to share just sound. So there might be an instance where, for instance, you are just having uh, open editing time and it's just really quiet. Um, and so then somebody will try to play music from their computer, but then you hear them typing at the same time. You don't have to do that. Uh, so you can, you can be on mute. So if you click the share screen button, and then click the advanced tab. And then you can click this option of music or computer sound only. And so then when I click that, then you can still see me, I can mute or, or unmute, and I could play 
something from Spotify or iTunes. We do have a collaborative Spotify list um, that is in the virtual guide that actually we would love for you to add to. So one other thing that um, can increase engagement and consensus within your Zoom um, event is polling. So let's see, you can use this tool in a couple of ways. Uh, consider using it to you know, gauge audience uh, knowledge of or familiarity with editing, for instance. Um, you can also, also ask something a little more fun and random, like the icebreaker. Um, it's a fun and poten potential way to get um, people not just staring at their computers, but actually clicking and showing that they're there. Um, so to ask a poll question, you'll be prompted to create your poll or your polls in a browser for your information. Um, they're then saved to your account and can be posed uh, to your participants again and again in other meetings, say, if you want. Um, another kind of more casual polling thing or engagement thing is to uh, encourage participants to use reactions. Um, such as clapping or thumbs up in like the previous uh, iteration, yeah, <laughs> previous iteration of Zoom. And then I recently updated and saw there were many more. So there's so many answers that can be answered with these. Um, so that's just a way to get people, you know, yeah, for fun. And second of all, engage in a little bit more. So the one thing like we were talking about, like pretty much like all the things on the back end have to be set up beforehand and you can't really do it. Polling's the exception. You can actually decide to set up a poll in, in the moment. So here, I'll click on it now. And this window pops up. Uh, Alex and Allison can't see this right now. And I click add a question and it will pop up in my, in my browser. And so this is where then I can edit, I can do a poll, so test poll. Um, here, uh, do we have consensus on X? Um, yes, no, and then I can click save. Um, and then I can go ahead and launch my poll. Um, this is, it's, it's cool because you can actually do this, um, like I said, ahead of time or in the meeting with polls. So if you both do we have consensus on X? You should see this on your screen, I hope. So something I just learned, I think since we're co-hosts. Oh, uh, you can't vote because you're co-host. Uh, That's yeah, right. So well, so everyone here is a co-host, so nobody can vote. <laughs> I also can't vote as a host, so yeah, learning things. So then if you, then we could share results and yeah. Um, a point of information, though, about polls and the recordings is that the image of the polls is not captured in the recordings of Zoom. So if that is important for your recording later, just be sure to read the poll and the poll results just to kind of capture that on the recording. Cool. All right. So next, I want to briefly talk about accessibility. Um, so there are a lot of things about Zoom to make it more accessible. We actually have, I really wanna encourage you again to look at this virtual resource that we put together. We have a whole section about accessibility, so I'm not going to go into all those steps right now, but really wanna encourage you to check that out. Um, some things that you can do about accessibility here, though, is one, as we mentioned earlier, having your video on is actually helpful for accessibility. Um, for certain participants, reading lips and body language might be really helpful for their experience. And then the other thing is this closed caption. So we actually have, um, at Art and Feminism, we have Otter AI. So I can show you what that looks like. Now I'm getting into like various other tools, sorry. <laughs> um, total, total segue here. But uh, so I just went live to show what Otter AI looks like. Um, and this is another feature that can help with accessibility, because what it does is it creates a live transcript of the meeting. And so 
you can see as I'm talking, it's it does a pretty good job. Unfortunately, it is limited to English only, at least at this moment for this tool. And <laughs> you can see the name of our meeting is Screen Capture Zoom for Real. Um, but then also going back, you can see, and Alice and Alex, you should see this too. In the top left, there should be a live on custom live streaming. So that is an option for closed captioning. The other option is um, I could actually copy this API token. And again, this is something that works with Otter, but could work in, there's, there's a couple other um, services that do this as well. But you'll see I'm on this Otter screen now, and I'm putting in the API token, and then I'm going back into Zoom, and then you should be able to see here at the bottom. Um, if you are at a university, there is another kind of Zoom called like, I don't know, it's like Zoom education or something like that. And there is a built-in Zoom closed caption for that. Um, and then a cool thing about the built-in closed caption here is that you can move this around. So I have like, you know, some black space over here where there isn't somebody's face. And so I can move the captioning over there. The, uh, what else do I want to say about this? Oh, interpretation is the other thing I wanted to mention about accessibility. Um, so interpretation, there is a pretty cool feature for interpretation on Zoom, but it comes at the more elevated um, price point. So it has comes with the webinar um, add on, which isn't that intuitive. And what it allows there for to be if you have, say, a Spanish language interpreter, um, the Spanish uh, speaking and um, participants can click. Uh, there would be like a little thing that says interpretation. It's not on the screen right now because we're not doing interpretation in this uh, session. And then they would be able to hear just the interpreter at, I think, 80% volume and then the main meeting at like 10 to 20% volume. Um, it's a cool feature it, and would love to talk to you more about it if you have specific questions about it. There's also Zoom help also has some um, videos about it as well that will be more direct than me explaining it right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're, of course, there, we always want to do better in this area. So if you have other thoughts and ideas on how to make meetings more accessible, would really love to, to uh, hear about them. Um, so then I'm going to talk about security a little bit. And again, we have a section about this in our, our virtual guide. Um, Zoom bombing is a real thing that I hope that you never have to experience. Um, we do have an appendix in the virtual guide that has suggested settings to specifically try to combat that. We also really encourage you to assign multiple hosts because say for instance, I'm talking and I'm presenting and I don't really see that there is just like violence happening in the chat. Alex or Allison, or if there's another co-host, they can kind of jump in and, and help with that. So we really encourage assigning multiple roles and multiple hosts to help with security. And then another thing is waiting rooms. Um, so actually with Zoom now, you either have to have a waiting room or a passcode, uh, or you can choose to have both. Um, we encourage, encourage uh, doing waiting rooms because it makes sure that you and the host are ready to receive people. And then also you can kind of look at the participants and you can see who's in the waiting room and you can either allow people in one by one or you can allow everyone in. Um, Allison, I actually don't know what the note means about noise alert of new waiting room folks. <laughs> Sorry, isn't there a thing where you can turn off, there's like a chime or like a jingle? Uh, maybe I'm dreaming. And, um... There's, there's, um, there's a chime that can happen when people enter. 
we suggest turning that off. That's in the appendix C too, because that can be that can be a lot. If you have a lot of people joining, it's just like chime, 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 chime. Um, yeah. I'm gonna throw it over to Alex. I just talked a whole lot. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to explain a little bit of the differences between Zoom meetings and webinars. So what we're in right now is a Zoom meeting, and these are ideal for hosting interactive sessions with lots of conversation and participation or breakout sessions like a meetup or an edit-a-thon. In meetings, participants can screen share and choose to have their cameras and audio on or off. The webinar feature is a paid add-on available with pro subscriptions, and I also wanted to mention that interpret the interpretation feature requires the webinar add-on, as Kira said earlier. So Zoom webinars are ideal for events with large audiences that do not have much interaction between attendees. Think panels or guest lectures with 50 plus attendees. In webinars, attendees are usually in a view-only mode and do not have the option to unmute or turn their cameras on. With webinar, you can assign roles as host, co-host, panelist, and attendee. Hosts and panelists are the only ones who can screen share in webinars. And I really like this feature. Um, webinar allows for the Q&A feature, which attendees can choose to ask questions anonymously. Um, they're typed questions. And then hosts and co-hosts can see all of the submitted questions, sort through them, read or assign them to panelists. And then attendees can also see which questions have been answered. Yeah, and so now I thought it'd be great if Allison and Alex could both talk a little bit about how they're using Zoom for their own events with Art and Feminism. So Alex, you want to go first? Yep. So I'm hosting a more self-guided virtual edit-a-thon this year. Throughout our edit-a-thon, my fellow co-organizers and me will be available in an open Zoom meeting. Editors will be able to pop in at any time to ask questions or chat and I anticipate that Zoom screen sharing feature will be really handy in helping participants edit or use Wikipedia so we can see each other's screens and maybe do walkthroughs. And then additionally, we're using Zoom webinar to host a guest speaker event um, that I anticipate will be widely attended. And we're going to record the event to make it available online, online to those who couldn't attend, who can't attend live. Um, and then a little bit of a pro tip in the past, I found it really helpful to assign roles to keep the event running smoothly, especially if it is a lecture or a Zoom webinar, um, designating someone who is not speaking during the event to answer any attendee chat questions, write notes in the chat during it, or record the meeting. I'm still in the earlier planning stages for my edit a thon, but um, I'm planning to have kind of an open Zoom meeting as well. Um, and so that folks feel some camaraderie. And I'm stealing Kira's pro tip about playing music only. I'm very excited about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's, it makes sense that like being in your planning stages of, of your event right now, and that's why we're doing this video and hopefully it's, it's helpful. And I feel like I rambled a little bit in the middle, so I apologize for that. Um, but to wrap it all up, I do wanna highlight that Zoom is not free. Um, and we recognize that. And so one of the things that we want to do to support our organizers is that we do have microfunding. And the microfunding in the before times is really for um, helping offset childcare or helping offset kind of food because food, of course, is an accessibility and community building tool as well. But we all, this year we're happy to cover costs like a Zoom membership to help you do your event. Um, and so if the microfunding guide and form are all on our website. And also we really want you to post your event on our website. Uh, being in the space that we are right now where pretty much everything is virtual, we've had some really cool experiences where people are able to attend events that they normally wouldn't. Um, and a great way to get the word out is to really post your event on our website. So hopefully this has been helpful for you all i want to thank allison and alex again for joining me and going through this tutorial and um thanks thanks so much and happy editing <laughs>